Hi, I'm Nora Lopez, executive editor of the San Antonio Express News. My guest today is John Quinones, a national TV personality with strong ties to San Antonio. He grew up here, attended Brackenridge High School and St. Mary's University. And from there, he attended Columbia University's School of Journalism. His success in front of the camera has made him a household name, most notably from ABC's What Would You Do? During his 40-year tenure as an ABC News correspondent, he has reported extensively from across the network's programs and platforms and has served as an anchor for 2020 Downtown and Primetime Live. His work has been recognized with eight national Emmys. And over the last year, he has been on the front lines of ABC News Uvalde 365 series, reporting from Uvalde in the aftermath of the shooting at Robb Elementary. Alongside his colleague, Maria Elena Salinas, the two have written a book about their experience there. One Year in Uvalde, a story of hope and resilience. We're pleased to have him in the studio today. Thank you, John, for being here today. That's so great excited. to be back home. How often do you get back to San Antonio? Probably once a month. Uh, I'm always getting invited to MC some event or raise funds for something or give a speech uh, here for St. Mary's and for Brackenridge High School, San Antonio College, uh, Christus Hospitals. All of your uh, alma maters. Yeah, yeah. Because you grew up here. And I was born at the Santa Rosa Hospital, so Christus is part of that. There you go. Well, tell me a little bit about you know, growing up on the West Side, um, I know you, I've read uh, parts of your memoir um, that you wrote some while back, and, and you talk about um, growing up on the West Side, um, Guadalupe Street, yeah. I think you uh, shine shoes for Tim. It was such a great experience, I, I honestly. Maybe I didn't think so then, because we didn't have much at all. My father, uh, you know, used to do yard work on Saturdays, and he, he was eventually uh, the janitor at Brackenridge High School, where I went to high school. So we didn't have a lot of money, uh, but my mom was very religious. She was at Guadalupana at St. Mm -hmm. Timothy's Catholic Church. Um, every Sunday night, we'd go to a panaeria, and my dad would spend 25 cents for a big bag of pan dulce. And those, you know, little things like that you learn to appreciate. Uh, I went to Carvajal Elementary, Rhodes Junior High, on the west side, which was a tough neighborhood. They called my, the gangs called it El Ghost Town. And God forbid you leave the ghost town and go to Los Altos, the neighboring uh, competitive uh, gang infested neighborhood because you could get beaten up. But yeah, I shined shoes when I was eight years old with my cousin Joey on Guadalupe Street. And we would go to all the cantinas, the bars, because the drunk guys didn't realize how much they were tipping you. Um, and then we were jumped one night and they stole all my rags and my shoeshine box that I made from scratch and my earnings. And that was the end of my shoeshining career. But I didn't speak English until I went to the first grade, like a lots of us in San Antonio, right? You don't have to hear. 60% of the population is Latino. My dad dropped out of the third grade to pick cotton in Lockhart, Texas. So he didn't finish school and neither did my mom. So we spoke Spanish at home, and I'll never forget being at, at Carvajal on the first day of school. Uh -huh. The school bell rings. I didn't know what the teacher was saying. Right. It was my first day. There's little Juanito Quinones sitting there twiddling my thumbs, and the school bell rings at 10 in the morning, and all the kids go to the playground, and where do I go? I walked home. I could have been Did you think school was over? I or? thought it was over. I got home my mother, Maria, and he said, Que paso, Juanito? What are you doing here? Se acabo. I said, man, it's over. I like school. You know, two hours and you're done. So it was a wonderful experience, and it built character, having to, you know, do without. Now I appreciate everything. In your memoir, I think, um, you touched on um, how you would climb up to the roof of your hall uh, and just, just dream, dream. Daydream, you know? That was my escape. You know, I loved being on the roof of the house because I could see the stars at night, and then it, they were building hemisphere remember mm -hmm. so the tower of the americas i saw it go up when i was in high school little by little and i used to and, and it sort of represented a world out there that was bigger than my little barrio in san antonio and i wanted to explore that because i always wanted to do journalism i would i love telling stories i used to watch Geraldo rivera on 2020 
this really cool guy with long hair and mustache and really sharp, and he would travel all over the world. And I wanted to be just like, like Geraldo Rivera. And uh, I got to meet him later, and he was wonderful. And I got to work on 2020 just like he. So the dream came true. That All is... that daydreaming on the roof of my house. And, you know, um, as Latinos, and we're both, and the reason I've, I've known you over the years is mm -hmm. through our involvement with the National Association of Hispanic Journalists. Yeah. And I think one of the things that we always talk about there, uh, you know, for us older generation, yeah. how there were so few role models, but we, we did have Geraldo. Um, and look at you. I mean, like, did you, is that really something you wanted to do? I mean, when did the idea first form in your mind that you wanted to do journalism? Uh, I, as a kid, I would w read the newspapers back when we read newspapers, right? <laughs> uh, with all respect to your newspaper. Um, and watch the news. And all the stories about Latinos in my neighborhood were negative stories. They were about gangs and, you know, illegal immigration and drugs. And I knew there were positive stories out there because I knew the heroes in my community at the Good Samaritan Center, which ironically I do a show about Good Samaritans, right? What would you do? Right. And I grew up at the Good Samaritan Center where we would play for free basketball and then the boys and girls clubs and, of course, St. Timothy's Catholic Church. I knew heroes in my community and no one was telling their stories. So I wanted to shine a light. I knew there were good stories that I could tell. And I wanted to write them. And then my, my high school English teacher in the 10th grade, Carmen Gutierrez, mm -hmm. when everyone else had told me I was in college material, because at, at Rhodes Junior High, my teachers would say, it's great, John, that you have this dream of someday being a television reporter, but we think you should try wood shop or metal shop or auto mechanics. Not that there's anything wrong with those great yeah. traits, right? A lot of my relatives make a good hard living doing that kind of work. Some of them pretty wealthy, right? But I wanted to go to college, and my own teachers and my own counselors would look at me and, and consider and, and, and assume that I wasn't college material because I didn't come from a family who had ever gone to college. I didn't have money to pay for tuition. My grades weren't that great at Rhodes Junior High. So basically, the message from my own teachers was, what gives you the audacity to think that you're college material, which is horrible for a young you know, 13-year-old. But in high school, at Brackenridge High School, my English teacher, Carmen you know, Gutierrez, was the one who said, John, I love the way you tell stories. I love the way you write your essays in English class. I want you to meet Mr. Harris, who runs the school newspaper, the Brackenridge Times. It was a weekly publication, and I became a reporter there when I was 13. So I've been doing this ever since. And pretty soon I became the chief of editorials for the Brackenridge Times. Mm -hmm. So there I was writing, Nora, these <laughs> in big investigative stories like, why are the teachers parking in the students' parking space? You know, that tonight we go undercover and find out. And I loved it. So that's where it started. Let's go back a little bit. You, where you were saying that you did, you know, you grew up in a Spanish-speaking household. Um, and I've, I've also heard you say over the years that, that like me, uh -huh. who also grew up in a Spanish-speaking household, I always had problems with the the CHS. Oh yeah. And I know uh, you've you've spoken. I, every about speech that. I give, I talk about it. I'm very proud of the fact. That, you know, having learned English as a second language, and in Spanish, there, are, there was no SH sound. So I would say, this is my chart. These are my shoes. And people would make fun of me. And I knew that. And I love accents. I think accents are wonderful. It's part of the melting pot of America. We are we're all different, right? But in television, in network television, I knew that I would never be able to succeed unless I conquered that. And I learned how to enunciate and pronounce these words. That's why I went to Brackenridge High School. Mm -hmm. I was supposed to go to Lanier in mm -hmm. my neighborhood, but I chose to go to Brack because I knew there uh, I would be going to school in a population that's one-third black, one-third Hispanic, and one-third white back then at Brack. Mm -hmm. In Lanier, I, it was all Mexicans, right? Which is wonderful, but I would not practice my English. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons I went there was to get rid of my accent. And I joined the drama class and I was Romeo and Romeo and Juliet. Uh, maybe that's because no one else tried out, <laughs> but I got it. And I learned on stage to reach the back of the auditorium with my voice. Project. And, and slow down. You know, as Mexicanos, we talk rapido, man, really fast. And I had to learn to slow down. It took me a while. Um, and when people were pointed out and sort of make fun of me, I didn't even understand what was it that there were that that yeah. my ear wasn't hearing it um 
ironically, it took a Brady Bunch episode, the one about Cindy with the list. Oh, yeah. That's when I finally was like, oh, okay, I think that's what they're trying to tell me. And so then I changed. Because we grew up in a community where everyone was like us. So it wasn't unusual. I interviewed Eva Longoria the other day, and she was telling me that growing up in Corpus Christi, she didn't know she was different until she got on a bus and was bused to another school, mm -hmm. a nicer school. Uh, it was part of the integration there. And uh, she said, people started whispering, she's Mexican, she's Mexican. She said, I didn't know I was Mexican until then. Now, um, you also were, were a migrant. Uh, For one summer, when I was 13, my dad was laid off from work and we needed money. And my mother and my sisters, Irma and Rosa Maria, we uh, joined a caravan of trucks headed north. Mm -hmm. So we went to Northport, Michigan, the cherry capital of the world, where we picked cherries for 75 cents a bucket. And I remember teetering on the top of these ladders overlooking orchards of trees. And it would take me, Nora, two hours to fill that darn bucket, which was strapped mm -hmm. around my neck, for 75 cents. So I would earn 75 cents for two hours or about 30 something cents an hour. But then we went to Ohio, like all migrants do, we followed the crops. Mm -hmm. So we went from Michigan to Ohio, Swanton, Ohio, outside of Toledo, where we picked tomatoes for 35 cents a bushel. And man, I was a champion tomato picker. I would do 100 <laughs> bushels a day. Wow. It's pretty good, it's $35, right? And my father would do 140 bushels and my sisters contributed and my Mother contributed, and we learned the value, as many Mexicano families in this community have learned, uh, the value of a family coming together in times of difficulty and pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps. But I'll never forget being on my knees on the cold, hard ground, and at six in the morning, looking at a row of tomato plants that for a young 13-year-old boy's eyes seemed to go on for miles and miles. That's what I had to look forward to that day. And my father, Bruno, looking down saying, Juanito, do you want to do this kind of work for the rest of your life? Or do you want to get a college education someday? It was a no-brainer. And I knew I didn't want to do that kind of back-breaking work. That's the beauty of migrant farm work, man. It tells you what you don't want to do, right? Well, I, I didn't know that you had worked in your student newspaper because yeah. I always talk about that, when, um, that I've been meeting a deadline since I was a sophomore in high school. Yeah, I've been doing this since <laughs> I was 13. I loved it. Uh, wow. There are pictures of me in the yearbook, <laughs> so you'll have to get it. Let's talk about making that progression in your career. You started off as an intern at uh, one of the local uh, radio uh, stations? Yeah, K K K Y X, the country music station mm -hmm. here. Um, I was 18, and I was at St. Mary's, and I was delivering medicine. i got to be careful how I say that, because when I say I was delivering drugs, people uh. assume I was a drug dealer. <laughs> Mexicano, of course. No, I was a drugstore delivery man for Blanco Pharmacies. Uh -huh. And uh, the, the owner, Richard Teniente, was wonderful. He was very civically involved. Mm -hmm. And he would hear me in the men's room practicing on a little cassette recorder because uh -huh. I was working on my accent. You know, I was trying to say shoes, shirt. And I wanted to be a reporter. And he would hear me from the men's Between my deliveries, uh -huh. I would practice in the men's room. Sure. And one night he heard me and he said, Johnny, you really want to do this? I said, yeah. He goes, well, I know the general manager of a radio station. And they're looking for interns. And by the way, they were looking for interns because there was a radical group of Mexicanos here who were protesting at every TV and radio station in San Antonio because we didn't have too many people who looked like you and me right. on television or on the radio. The BBC, Bilingual, by, Bilingual Bicultural. Bicultural Coalition on the Mass Media, yeah. the BBC. <laughs> and they were part of the Brown Berets. Oh, These yeah. were radical dudes, mm -hmm. and they were picketing with posts, and they said, if you don't hire more Mexicanos in San Antonio, which is 60% Hispanic, mm -hmm. we're gonna ask the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, to deny your license to broadcast that's their license they were to print yeah. money. Yeah. So these radio and TV stations freaked out, and they started hiring anyone with a decent voice, including this 18-year-old kid uh, at St. Mary's. So, uh, yeah, I started with KKYX. It's funny because I, I, I was watching some um, old videotape of you, and it was very, very early. I think you were reporting from somewhere in Central America. Mm -hmm. yeah. But your voice didn't quite sound like it does today. So, yes. <laughs> Maturity, I guess, really. When I was listening to it, I was like, okay, he's, you didn't yet have that deep baritone and that uh, cadence of a you know, broadcast yeah. journalist. I think I learned that over the years. Um, and with What Would You Do, it's more casual. Mm -hmm. 
so that delivery, I laugh more and it's, I'm not so serious as a journalist because for so many years I was, you know, really doing hard news, those wars in Nicaragua and El Salvador and Panama. And you never smiled at all because these were tough. You stories. were covering some really tough assignments, mm -hmm. I think, early in your career. I mean, you were everywhere. Yeah. Um, you were covering, uh, was it in Colombia, the kids who were living in, in the, the sewers. sewers? Yeah, uh, the sewer kids. I was there <clears throat> covering an election, but that story didn't turn out to be much of a story. The election mm -hmm. turned out like people presumed and no one was killed by the cartels. Mm -hmm. So the networks didn't care so much about that anymore. But I saw from my hotel room children running into the sewer systems. And I asked, who are those kids? And the lady who worked for us in Colombia in Bogota said, they're gamines. They're children who live in the sewers. There's 300 runaways and they have nowhere else to go. They lived in the sewers, Nora, next to the rivers of waste. And I called New York and I said, I got to do this story. And I got to do it for primetime live, even though I wasn't one of their reporters. Mm -hmm. For Diane Sawyer and Sam Donaldson, they let me do this story about these poor children who had no choice but to live in the sewer systems, which festers with germs and disease. You can imagine. We went down there and we interviewed this 16-year-old girl who had just given birth in the sewer oh to a baby. Um, and the, the day after my story aired on primetime, American viewers sent in a million dollars in donations. People's hearts were so broken watching this that the man who was trying to help them was able to build an orphanage in Bogota called Los Niños de los Andes, the children of the Andes. Mm -hmm. And all of them were pulled out of the uh, sewers. Again, that the power of that camera and the light when you shine it on important issues like that. But yeah, that was my, one of my favorite stories. And it won an Emmy Award. Mm -hmm. and I was going to ask you, so now you've won seven Emmys? Eight. eight. Oh, excuse me. We just won me. one last oh, okay. two weeks ago for you, Valde. Hasn't been updated on your week. <laughs> I never, <Yes>. yeah. <laughs> um, what did that feel like when you won that first one, you know, being this little brown boy from the West Side to be recognized for your work as a journalist? It was a huge deal. But the very first one was not that. That was the first National Emmy mm -hmm. Award, but the first local uh, Emmy was in Chicago uh, for a story that I did when I was 26 years old. So when you where I the swam across yeah. the Rio Grande mm -hmm. undercover. I told all my friends, I'm going to go undercover. I'm going to pose as a Mexican. <laughs> they all said, <laughs> like, you know, it's not going to take a lot of acting, you know. <laughs> you are Mexican. No, but I was posing as an immigrant. Mm -hmm. And uh, I found a coyote mm -hmm. for 300 bucks back then. Now it costs 30000 right? right? Uh, this is 40 years ago. And he puts me on an inner tube, and I floated across the Rio Grande, uh, all captured on hidden camera. And then I went to a restaurant in Chicago, mm -hmm because we wanted to make it local for Chicago. It sure. was for the Chicago station. Right. But Chicago has a big Mexican population. And I went to this restaurant where we had heard that the owner of this restaurant had seven undocumented workers working for him from Mexico, mm -hmm. and he had not paid them in 17 weeks. Oh, my God. And every time they complained, he would say, hey, guys, you get to sleep here in the basement. You get to eat all the food you want. You keep complaining. We'll call immigration and have you deported. Mm -hmm. And you know that happens in this country today, 40 years later. So I went there and I got a job as a dishwasher. Hablando puro español, you know, I spoke mm -hmm. Spanish, dressed down. And I was, again, I was about 26, 27. So I looked the part of a recently arrived immigrant. Mm -hmm. And the guy hires me as, an, uh, as a dishwasher. So with a hidden camera, I worked at this restaurant. And then I slept in the basement with the other seven Mexicanos. For how long? For just a night. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. you know, let's not push it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Two days and one night. But I long enough to go down there and sleep with the guys. And then I still wonder what they must have thought. Mm -hmm. Because by day I'm washing dishes and bussing tables with them. And then I pulled out a little camera when we were alone in the basement. Mm -hmm. Next to the dishes and the silverware and the cans of food. And I started interviewing them in Spanish. Mm -hmm. Again, the beauty of diversity in journalism. Mm -hmm. Because I'm Mexicano, I was able to do this story because I look the way I do. So in Spanish, I started interviewing them about their lives at that restaurant, having not been paid in 17 weeks. And through tears, they told me how they were being held as virtual, you know, against their will in that restaurant. So the next day, I came back to work at the restaurant, this time wearing a suit, speaking fluent English, with a camera crew behind me. Can you imagine how the owner of that restaurant felt the day before, I'm his dishwasher, and now I'm a journalist peppering him with questions. And um, 
he I remember we had to chase him through the parking lot at the, at the restaurant because he didn't want to talk to me. Mm-hmm. But the day after my story aired in Chicago, my first local Emmy, the U.S. government moved in. They shut down the restaurant. They arrested the owner and they got the Mexicanos the money they were owed and temporary visas to remain here while they worked on their residency. And I knew then that those were the kinds of stories that as a Latino, I might be able to tell perhaps better than other folks. And it seems like you gravitate to those kinds of stories. Um, You've spent the last year uh, in Uvalde uh, reporting on the aftermath of the Rob Elementary um, shooting which uh, is unique in and of itself because most of the time um, networks swoop in on a town where there's exactly. some kind of a catastrophe or we tragedy. Spent a couple of weeks there and then we leave to the next one, right? So how did this come about that you spent on and off? I mean, you weren't there all year long. But no, but my off. son was there all the time. Nico, he's a cameraman and producer. And it was that was a treat working with him and also painful witnessing what we saw there and having to interview the surviving families. Uh, But it came about because the president of ABC News and one of our executive producers thought about it. They said, you know what? This is such a tragedy in this little dusty town outside of San Antonio where 19 children have died and two teachers. We have to stay there and let's hold them accountable. We want to know what happens when the cameras leave. You know, when everyone else leaves, we open up an office and they spend millions of dollars. It's a tribute to ABC News and Disney. Uh, that they were able to commit those resources. It wasn't me, but they did ask me and Maria Elena Salinas from Univision, who's now uh, contributing to ABC, to, right. to to be the face of our coverage. And you wrote a book, um, A Story of Hope and Resilience. Um, can you tell me about that hope and resilience that you witnessed and how has it affected you? you it was know? such a tragedy, of course. You can imagine losing your children. There were times when my son would be behind a camera filming me and another camera was filming the parents that I was talking to. And we were in tears, you know, it was so heartbreaking. Many of the staff, because we had about 15, 20 people there in and out uh, for ABC, had to undergo therapy after a year because it was so sad and heartbreaking. But it was very, very, um, what inspired me most of all was that, that there is hope that after, from the ashes of this horrific tragedy, rose these people, Mexicanos, most of them, right, who, um, who carried on and, and ran for office and protested and went out and picketed and went to Washington and in Austin demanding, you know, uh, better gun laws and, and running for office, for political office. They, they didn't win, you know, but Javier Cáceres, the, the father of little Jackie, nine-year-old Jackie, who died in the tragedy, he ran for office. Kimberly Rubio, who, whose daughter, Lexi, also died in the tragedy, ran for mayor of Uvalde. She's become quite an advocate for, and that's what impressed us, that hope and resilience that, that our people really can show, even in the face of horrible tragedy. Let's talk real quickly about the show that has made you a household name, and you can't travel anywhere without somebody asking you what, what you, you do. do. Yeah, I love it. It's, we, it's in its 17th season. We're, we're airing right now on Wednesday nights. ABC loves it. Uh, we've filmed two seasons all over the country. And basically, it was an idea that I had to hold up a mirror to American society. We wanted to, ho- to know, how do you unlock the power and the light that exists in each and every one of us mm-hmm. to remind us and make us better equipped to say, hey, that's wrong, or how can I help? What would you do poses that very question. When you witness any kind of injustice, gay bashing, racism, bullying, Mm -hmm. spousal abuse, anything. We've done 1,200 scenarios. When you see anything like that and the little voice in the back of your head says, do something, do you step in or do you step away? That's the beauty of the show. And in the end, that really is the ultimate test of a person's character, Nora, right? It's not what we do when everyone's watching. That's easy. It's what we do even when we think no one is watching. And uh, it restores your faith in America. At a time where this country can seem so divided, certainly politically uh, right now, um, we think that we're all going to hell in the handbasket. You see how real people react, and it reminds us that we, despite our differences, are much more alike 
then we are different. And it doesn't matter whether you're in Wyoming or Texas or New York City. Uh, people are people. And genuinely, I, I think, people ask me all the time, you've, been, you've had your finger on American behavior. Are we good or are we bad? And I think, you know, we're good. It's just that sometimes we're afraid to get involved with good reason. There can be repercussions. But, you know, we should... We can be afraid of a lot of things, but we should never be afraid to do the right thing. Has there ever been a moment when you thought, oh, no, we're not going to we're not going to get out of this without a really tense situation going on? Has it have there been moments that have been? Yeah. Tense? Yeah. And because of that, I, I jump out from hiding as soon as things seem to be getting really serious. Mm -hmm. I like to push it to see how far people will go. But there comes a point where we really have to make sure that no one gets hurt and no one takes a swing at someone. And we also have a security person right there in the middle of the action so that if I can't get there fast enough to stop it, he or she can stop it by saying, no, no, it's just a show. So there are times when it gets a little cagey, but knock on wood, we've been able to, to avoid any kind of serious issue like that. Well, thank you, John. We appreciate you being here with us today. Thank you, Noda. Thank you for being here. If you would like to let us know your thoughts on this show or suggestions for future guests, you can send an email to texastalk at klrn.org. Until next time, I'm Nora Lopez.